Hello and welcome to today's Forum 5 of the Software Engineering Workshop at the Teens in AI AI Accelerator. Today and tomorrow we will be focusing on programming and we're going to combine both days so I'm going to tell you as much as we can do in, uh, in a couple of hours really about programming and then I want you to spend really the majority of day four and the whole of day five on your programming exercise and hopefully you'll have something really cool to show your friends and family at the end of this. So here's my favorite quote on software programming. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. And this was said by Martin Fowler, one of the founding fathers of Agile and one of the greats of software engineering. So before we start with the whole programming exercise, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about you know, programming itself. Um, and how, you know, the sort of things that you would learn in a computer science degree, I guess. Um, the main start of the programming um, era um, started with something called imperative programming. Imperative programming was um, or consists on writing statements that tell the computer step by step what to do. And that imperative means commands. It's, it's basically giving very clear commands to the computer to tell it what to do. And, and this is generally done at the native machine language level. Um, and, and, you know, we still use those in some industries, uh, particularly for embedded processes and things that need programming at the very, very close to the metal, as we call it. Um, but generally, um, it's, uh, it's, it's an uncommon way of programming nowadays. The next one is logical programming. And logical programming is fairly rare. It's normally used for things like proving mathematical theorems and things like that. Effectively, what it does is it defines a set of facts and clauses that say something like, uh, man is human, uh, Socrates is man, and then you can ask the computer, is Socrates human? And you know, it should give you the right answer. So it's quite a strange uh, mathematical way of approaching programming and is very rarely used outside academia. Next is uh, functional programming. Functional programming is, is basically based on mathematics and it just relies on the code all being parts of functions. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about functions when we delve into how Python implements them, but effectively it's just a group of uh, mathematical or functional code um, expressions that make the computer do specific instructions. Um, now, uh, the, the key principle of functional programming is that everything is a function, including the program itself. It's just a collection of functions within a function. Um, and a typical example of functional programming is JavaScript. If you guys have done anything to do with web development, um, JavaScript is a prototypical uh, language paradigm for functional programming. Um, and last but not least, um, and in fact, it's going to be the focus of our um, workshop this week, is object-oriented programming. And object-oriented programming is basically the most used out of all the paradigms right now. And it's a little bit of ag aggregation of all of them. So it borrows things from all the major paradigms and effectively consists on focusing on objects which are effectively representations in the world and it's a collection of data and behavior. Um, so for example, I could define a, um, an object that's a car and a car has, uh, you know, can be driven. Um, it has a number of seats, it has a number of wheels, that sort of stuff. So I can actually um, develop a model of what a car represents and then I can do different variants of it. Um, as I say, it's the most common uh, paradigm uh, and we're going to focus the rest of this workshop on that particular model. So why are we going to focus on object-oriented programming? As I said, it's the most common of all the paradigms. And because it borrows of, from all of them, it sort of teaches you a little bit about functional programming and a little bit of imperative, maybe even some logical programming. Um, it's supported by a wide variety of languages. Uh, but, you know, Python, the one that we're going to, to use today, is definitely one of them. Uh, but, you know, typical, the, the, the typical languages support C++, C Sharp, Java, uh, Ruby and also JavaScript if you program in the object-oriented model uh, within JavaScript itself, even though it's a functional programming language. Um, it has great unique advantages that make things much easier. Um, it's, it's a very modular language, so you can actually write objects or chunks of code um, that can be reused, but most importantly that represent or can be mapped one-to-one -to, -one to real world business problems. Um, and that makes it very, very easy for humans to actually realize the parts of code that you have to um, use in order to solve the challenges that the client may give you. And so overall, it's just easy to use. It gives you a good 
understanding of, um, of programming because it models itself in how the world works. So what are the key characteristics of object-oriented programming? Well, if you look at this pyramid, um, there's, there are the basic principles or characteristics of um, OOP, and you start from the bottom up. So, you know, the first principle is um, encapsulation. And encapsulation means that the data and the internal behavior of an object is actually encapsulated. Um, so it's hidden from the external world. All the internal work is actually hidden from the outside world. Only if you're working with that object and writing that object or that class itself, uh, you understand how the code works inside it. But the, the idea is that the outside world only sees the data and the behaviors you want to expose out of it. But the default is everything is hidden behind it. And that's the principle of encapsulation. Above encapsulation, we have abstraction. And that's where we separate the external look um, um, of, the op of the class, which is what we call the interface. It's how the outside world sees the object from the outside and its implementation, which is how it's actually coded inside. And as I said, encapsulation keeps that code hidden from the rest of the world. And abstraction is the way that you actually separate how it's implemented internally to how it's seen and interacted with from the outside world. Polymorphism is the next layer up, and that's actually quite um, uh, an interesting uh, concept. Uh, polymorphism means that an object or a class um, can actually behave um, or respond in different ways uh, by being represented by different types, even though the um, inputs um, are the same. So, for example, I can have um, a, um, an object of type vehicle, uh, but then I can actually have, and I'll see the layer up above is called inheritance, and I can actually create an object type car, which inherits from vehicle, and I have another uh, vehicle type, which is actually motorcycle. And you can see how um, to drive a car or to drive a motorcycle are different things, but they're actually both vehicles. And so this is the concept of a type like vehicle having multiple behaviors based on what, um, what, what wrapper you put around it. And that's the concept of inheritance. That you can see that's a hierarchical relationship uh, where you have a parent class vehicle and children or, or child classes uh, like motorcycle, like uh, um, car, truck, other, other types of vehicles are all inherit of this initial base class that we call vehicle. So this, this aggregation, this layering concept is, is key to object-oriented programming. Ultimately, on top of this sits the class, and the class is basically a template or a blueprint for what objects are. And objects are actually instances of classes. So you could think of, um, of a class as being a form, the template of a form that has all the questions and none of the answers. And then you have the object, which would be a filled-in form. Um, so effectively, you can have lots of objects based on the same class. I could I could give a whole classroom uh, the same questionnaire, and I would get a back a lot of filled-in questionnaires with lots of different answers. That's the same relationship between class and object. So when is it good to use object-oriented programming? Well, um, I mean, you can look here at um, uh, Holigan. That you can you have the reference at the bottom, so you can read more about this. But there are typical examples, and this applies very much to what we're trying to achieve with this workshop and what you're going to do in the next couple of weeks. It's when you have multiple programmers uh, that don't need to understand what's inside its object. And then, you know, as we said, encapsulation is great, is, is the founding principle, is one of the things that makes object-oriented interesting, because as long as you understand the outside of the object, you don't need to worry about how it's implemented unless you write the code yourself. Um, it also means that because you have this um, encapsulation uh, and, and classes that represent functionality and data, you can reuse those objects in lots of different scenarios. So you can build lots of apps with the same object models um, and then just reuse that code. You don't have to write it again. And also, if the project is anticipated to change often and to be layered on over time, you know, with the principles that we talked about, inheritance and abstraction and all these sort of principles are actually great to allow you to have this base class that has some fundamental behavior and then keep on adding new variants of it without actually modifying the base levels. And that allows your project your projects to morph and to change shape and to evolve over time without causing lots of issues. So having said that, how do we go about learning Python? Okay, it's very hard to actually learn a language in detail um, in, in literally an hour. So what I'm trying to do here is like in a few slides, I'm gonna show you the basics of Python um, and then we'll go through an actual live example that we'll, we'll go through together and then hopefully that will be a good base for you to do your, um, your challenge for the next two days. So the first and most important principle in, in Python is the fact that it needs indentation. Now indentation is basically 
the spaces at the beginning of a code line. And I know that sounds weird, but Python is one of the few languages that actually requires indentation to indicate different blocks of code. So any any lines of code that are at the same level of indentation are assumed or are considered by the by the Python interpreter to be part of the same code block. So look at this example that we have here. We're saying the first, the one that says OK, you can see that if 5 is greater than 2, and then we have an indentation, print 5 is greater than 2. And that's good because that's how it's suspected to be. Um, the print statement, it's a, it's a child clause of the if statement. So effectively, there are two levels, two separate levels. One at the parent level, the other one at the child level. If you look at the one underneath that says error, you see that if 5 greater than 2, and then we print, those two are actually at the same level. So effectively, what we're telling the interpreter, these two are at the same level of execution. So it doesn't matter what the if says, the print will be executed no matter what. And obviously, the, the, the interpreter won't like that, so it'll give you an error anyway. So indentation is important, and consistent indentation. So if you use two spaces per indentation, then make sure they use two spaces for everything that's at the same level, even if it's for you know, quite a few lines below. If you use tabs, then you know it's easier. Um, then we look at the variables. What is a variable? A variable is, is simply a container to store data values. And, and we can store all sorts of different values. And here I'm trying to summarize in, in a single picture um, both the types of data that you can use in, uh, in Python, but also how you can name variables. And you can see how I say legal variable names at the top and illegal variable names at the bottom. Um, legal variable names have to start with a letter or with an underscore. They cannot start with a number. So if you look at the illegal variable names, that first one, to my var, is an illegal name. You can see it's blue because the, the interpreter will try to work out that you're writing a number and then obviously give you an error because you're just adding weird letters afterwards. So variables will never start with a number. They will never contain a high interpreter that has a minus. And obviously that's not a valid variable name. And it will never have spaces because that would just be two separate keys, uh, keywords. And that will also uh, cause the interpreter to fail. If you look at the ones above, you can see that any combination of capitals, lowercase, underscores, all those are okay. Um, you can add numbers. See the last one, my dictionary one. Uh, but that number is at, is either is never the first character. It could be anything after the first letter, but not the first character of that variable name. And here we can see um, uh, the first one. My name is is a string. We have quotes because basically says this is the text Alfonso. Um, the next one, some boolean is actually a boolean. So booleans are things that can be either true or false. And so the two values that this variable can have are true with a capital T or false with a capital F. Um, then you have an integer, which is uh, a number with no decimals. Then you have a float, which is a number with decimals, and it could be positive or negative. Then you have a list, and a list is just a list of things, and things could be strings, could be floats, could be integers, could be you know anything you want. Um, but you can see that the list is defined with square brackets, and then separated by commas. Then you have a tuple. A tuple is, is something that's a collection of things that happen at the same time. So it's it's three values that are stored in one single Thing, and that thing is called a tuple. In this case, I have a tuple of three strings. I could have a tuple of three name, uh, three, three objects, three numbers, a number, a string, and a, you know you can do any combinations you want. And the last one is a dictionary. And a dictionary is curly braces, and they're pairs of values. So you can have an unlimited list, comma separated list of pairs of values, and the pairs are always um, a string, which is the name of the of the value you want to store. We, we call that the key. And then you have a value, which is the actual thing. And the value could be a string, could be a number, like you see here. Um, so that's the basics for what um, indentation and variables are in Python. So upping the level of complexity a little bit now, we're going to look at loops and functions. So there are several types of loops, but the most important, the one that we're going to use the most, is what we call the for loop. Um, and a loop is effectively iterating over a sequence of things. And a sequence of, a sequence of things could be a, a list, a tuple, a dictionary, a set, or even a string, uh, if we iterate over each character of a, of a string itself. Um, so in the example here, you can see I have a list, because it's got square brackets. And I've um, defined it as a list of fruits. Um, and then I have a for loop that says, for x in fruits colon, print x. 
So x is the name of the variable I'm going to use temporarily to iterate over that list. So that x will take the three values in sequence. First it will be apple, then it will be banana, then it will be cherry. And then the next line you can see is indented because it's inside the loop, so it's the next code, code block. It will print the content of x. So if I run that code, it will just write three lines, apple, banana, and cherry. Um, now, one level more complexity is functions, and we said in functional programming, it's a way of actually um, encapsulating a set of um, statements that can be executed uh, together when I invoke that, fun that function. So a function is defined by the def word, and you can see that in blue, def, and then a function name with um, a set of brackets. Now those brackets could be empty if, if that function just doesn't need to get any external arguments or parameters from the outside world, or it could have a list of parameters there that could be anything specific that data that you want to pass into that function to, to work with. In this case, we have a very simple function. So it's def, my function, brackets, and then colon. The colon is always important because that's telling you I've just finished defining the function. I'm now going to tell you the code block that defines the function. And the code block is obviously indented because it belongs to the, the, the definition of the function. And in this case, what it's doing is printing hello from a function. And that's how you define a function. Now, how you call that function, so actually the code can then use the function wherever and however many times you want, is to actually call the function with the brackets. Um, and in this case, I'm just doing my function brackets, and that would just print hello from a function. And finally, and the highest level of complexity, and here's where you can see that it gets a little bit tricky, is uh, Python classes and inheritance. Like we mentioned before, Python is very much an object-oriented language, and, uh, and so it implements the concept of class and the concept of inheritance. On the left side there, you can see that uh, classes and objects. So a class, as we said, is the template. It's, it's the thing that defines what, um, what can be done with a class, what data and what behaviors it has. And then an object is how you instantiate, how you make, you know, how you get that questionnaire and fill in the form uh, to make it a unique object. So that you see the class definition there. It starts with the keyword class. Then you give it a name. So in this case, we're going to define a class called person. And then you give it a colon. And then um, optionally, but recommended, is what we call the constructor. And the constructor is, is a function within the class that has the, the underscore, underscore in it, underscore, underscore. And this is a, a quirk of Python. Some of the um, language-defined functions have that double underscore before and after. Then it passes self, and self means the class itself. So it's passing a pointer to itself. And then in this particular type, which is um, person, we've chosen to pass two parameters to the constructor, name and age. And then you can see how we actually set self.name and self.age to the values that we've passed through the parameters. And what that's saying is, okay, the person has two properties, and those properties are name and age, and my constructor, my initializer, is going to ask whoever wants to create an object based on this class to pass those two things, so I can create that filled-in questionnaire version. So I'm, I'm giving you a blank person, and you have to give me the details inside it for it to become an object. So then the next lines, you can see P1, person1, equals, and then this is how you invoke and you create an object. You call the class name, and then in brackets, you pass the actual parameters that you need for the initializer. Sometimes there won't be any. So we just, you know, sometimes you could have an object that does, the, the initializer has nothing, just self. And so you will call person brackets. But in this case, we're going to call person brackets and then easy and 15, which creates a person with a name easy and an age 15. And then if I do a print statement for those two things, I should see easy and 15. So that's, that's class as an object. Now on the right hand side, you can see the next level of complexity. You see that I have the same code at the top for person. I still have my name and age, but I've added a new function and that extends my person class. So my person class now has its own method, its own behavior assigned to it, which is print name. So if I say I want to print myself as a person, um, and then you see there's some cool trickery that you know it's good for you to take note on how to do what we call formatted strings. Uh, in Python 3 particularly, you can you can see that um, if I use curly braces where I would like to replace values later, I could define a, a piece of text that says, this is curly braces, comma, h curly braces. And what I'm going to do next is to print that string with the command, with the uh, behavior dot format, and then pass it the parameters I want to replace those curly braces with. And so you can imagine that whatever person I instantiate, 
uh, as an object, if I call print name of that function, it will say this is, you know, in this case, we have we can see here um, a name and an age. So for inheritance, what we're doing is we're going to create a new class. And notice there's a new class. So we're not creating an object yet. We're creating a child class of the parent person. And we're going to call that class student. And so the way that we create um, a child class of a parent is to actually put the parent inside the bracket. So I'm going to say, I'm going to create a class called student, which inherits from person. And then you see this weird command called pass. Pass just means that the class really doesn't implement any new functionality other than I create something that I want to refer to as student rather than person. So it's a little bit more defined, but actually it doesn't implement any new functionality. So pass just means that it tells the, the interpreter not to give me an error just because I haven't written anything in the class. Um, so that's a good one to know, especially if you're um, creating placeholder code or stops, as we call them, just to get you a bunch of classes, but the, they don't do anything other than uh, leverage polymorphism, which is what we described before. So now what you can see here is in order to instantiate a student um, object, what I'm going to do is basically the same. I have a variable equals, you know, x equals student, and then I'm passing the same parameters as I used to pass to person. But in this case, I'm just going to call him Will, age 13. But now, because the, the class, the person class has been extended, I have a print name function. So I'm then immediately going to say, okay, and now of that object, x, which is student, which happens to be a person because it inherits from person, print name, which is not defined in student, but in its parent class person, is now going to write, this is Will, age 13. And this is the beauty of object orientation and inheritance. The behavior that's common to all the different inherited classes you want to create, you can pull up into the parent class. So you don't have to do lots of code. And this is the beauty of object orientation. It allows us to um, use the common code and push it up to the base classes. So that then you have specialisms like, you know, what we were describing the vehicle and then the car and the motorcycle. You can have specifics uh, further down in child classes, but things that are common, like number of wheels, um, uh, brand name, things like that, that are common to all types of vehicles, you can roll up into the base class and then inherit the different ones. And that is pretty much everything you need, at least to get you started with Python. And obviously that's, you know, I'm not going to leave you there. So now we're going to do our um, lovely demo. And with the demo, hopefully I'll get you started with what I'd like you to progress in the next two days to build a really cool um, app stroke game um, that you can you know, show your teammates and your family and have fun with yourselves, particularly if you enhance it to the point where it becomes really, really complex and cool. So let's see where that takes us. Hi, and welcome to our last demo of the workshop. We're going to do some programming and uh, hopefully I'll leave you with the beginnings of a cool game that you may be able to develop into something very, very fun to play. Um, it's going to be mostly command line based. Um, those more advanced developers amongst you, feel free to go for the graphics. Maybe, maybe make it into a web app or something more fancy. Um, so here you have uh, Visual Studio Code, as we've had for the whole week. Um, I've created a folder called Pipette and you'll see why in a minute. Um, it's completely empty at the moment, so we have to start from scratch. Now, I'm not going to use TDD uh, here because we need to get through it fairly quickly so you have time today and tomorrow to, to get some uh, traction. Um, so I can have a really long video showing you everything I want to show you, including TDD. So be, one of the challenges I will give you um, at the end of this will be to use TDD. Um, but, you know, you evaluate how much time you have left of the week and uh, make a call um, as to whether you're going to use it or not. I'm not going to use it here because I want to focus on the programming aspects, not the TDD methodology right now. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do. And uh, I'll give you the reference to the lady who invented this sort of game um, as, a, as a tool to teach Python. Uh, and I've sort of modified it somewhat and, and got into the more object-oriented aspects of it. Um, the, the game is called Pipette, and uh, for those of you who are as old as me, you probably know what a Tamagotchi is. Um, if, if you don't know, then, you know, look it up. It's, um, it's basically a virtual pet, effectively, that we used to have in our little keychains and things when, when I was a kid. 
Um, we're going to make a digital version of it. Um, very simple to start, but with the potential of becoming really, really cool and fun to play um, if you do follow the challenges I'll give you at the end. So, uh, first things first, um, I'm going to define a very, very basic um, class that defines what a pet or, or, or a pipette looks like. In order to do that, I'm going to create a new file and I'll call it pipette.py. And that's going to be our first um, sort of um, class only file. So there's not going to be any um, application code here, just um, the class itself. And uh, as we described in the um, introduction, to make a class, we start by typing class. And then I'm going to call it pipette. Don't forget the colon because that's very important. And pipette is going to have a number of uh, properties. So those properties I'm going to define with the constructor, the, the initialization function that we talked about. So in order to do that, remember I'm indented because I'm now doing a code block inside the class that belongs to class. I'm going to use def and then that in interesting way of naming functions in, oops, it will be an init function. Um, and then we know it's self, it's the class itself. And now I'm going to give you a list of um, parameters or arguments that I think the pipette should support in order to have, you know, at least some properties to get you started. So I'm going to have a name. We're going to have an H. We're going to have a weight. And we're going to have a photo. Now, bear with me. The photo is not going to be as visual as you hope, but it's going to be pretty cool. Um, and that's the in it. And I'm going to basically add the... Um, properties to the class that will be assigned those values. And to do that, you do self dot and then each one of those variables. So my name variable will belong, will be filled up with whatever, um, whoever wants to create a, a pipette object will invoke as the name parameter. And the same for the uh, other parameters. So self h equals h, uh, weight equals weight and photo equals photo. Right, so, so far we have a class pipette with a constructor or an initializer, uh, which takes four parameters um, and they basically fill in the basics of uh, what a pipette is. Now, in order to be able to um, invoke this, we're going to create another file, which is our app file, app.py, and we need to import our pipette. So from, for that, we'll have to do from pipette, the file, import the actual class, pipette. And that allows us to invoke um, or create an object based on the pipette class. I'll save that. And uh, let's start with a very basic welcome to pipette. You know, you know what that's going to that's going to do. It's just going to print that line. Now, if you want to see how to um, create an object, I'm going to create a my pet variable, and I'm going to instantiate a pipette class. And if you remember to instantiate. I have to invoke and then see with uh, Visual Studio Code very helpfully it tells me the four parameters I can invoke it with. So I'm going to say um, fluffy and h3 weight two kilos and photo I'm going to leave blank for now and I'll show you why in a second. Um, and now if we run this we probably won't see anything happening, just because there we go. It's, it's run, but there's nothing happening because we're not really. Well, it's obviously done. Welcome to my, to Piped, but it's not really the class instantiation to, into object. It's not doing anything yet. So what we want to do, really, is to actually enhance our class. So um, something interesting happens when um, when we ask it to. And you can see how I've indented back because I'm going to define a new function um, and I'm going to call it 
speak. Now every class function has to have self as the first parameter because it just allows um, the function to be able to call any of these self variables you have. You see, you see here self name, age, weight, photo, etc. However many you have. So um, what does the and obviously I need a column to, to end the definition line and then I need to specify what um, that speaker's going to say. At this point I'm going to make it very basic and I'm going to say hello my name is and then add the name. So to add the name just do self dot name. I'm going to save that. I'm going to go back to the app and now run it and hopefully down here we'll see oh wait you see where I went wrong I haven't actually told the object what to do so if I now do my pet speak and to invoke the function I have to do brackets like that see even I made mistakes like that we'll see again there we go hello my name is fluffy oh look notice something wrong there this is a typical mistake when you do strings. Um, I'm appending the two strings together, but I forgot to put space in there. Let's try that again. And there we go. Hello, my name is Fluffy. Um, that is not very exciting just yet. Um, so we need to think of more things to do. Now, in the old times when I had my Tamagotchi ring, um, the two main things you could do with the Tamagotchi was to feed it, and to play with it. So let's go back to our class and think about what can we do in order to feed the Tamagotchi. Um, let's create a function called feed. Again, pass the self parameter because it's a class function. Um, beauty of Visual Studio Code is already indenting the code for me, so it'll save me that hassle. And then I'm going to create a new um, class property called hungry. And because I'm just feeding uh, my pet, the moment I feed it, uh, it won't be it won't be hungry anymore. So it'd be false. But it would also get slightly fatter. So I'm going to say the weight equals, and if you see this plus equals means my weight will be my weight plus whatever amount I put here. I'm going to say 0.1 kilos because why not? Save and that's our uh, feed. Now we can't really tell whether um, our pet was um, hungry or not at the beginning. So let's make sure that in the initialization here we start the pet with hungry equals true so that we know that um, the pet when first created will be hungry so they're born hungry um, now I can't really tell either when when I instantiate it so if, if I go here there's nothing here to tell me whether the pet is hungry or not right it just tells me its name so let's um, improve this somewhat and say I'm going to add and I'm hungry. Now, if it tells me this every time, obviously it doesn't really matter whether um, this variable is true or false because it's always going to be hungry. So obviously that's wrong. So what we should do is use the if statement. And an if statement basically it says if something happens, then do something. So I'm going to say if self hungry and then you do the column because we're defining a code block and I indent so saying when I am asked to speak if I am hungry I will say I am hungry so let's save this go to the app and here now that we're calling speak we should see something slightly different to before there we go hello my name is Fluffy and I'm hungry now what will happen if I did my pet dot feed, um, obviously something will happen because we're calling the feed function, but we won't be able to see unless we make the pet speak again. So we're going to make him speak again. Let's run that 
and see what we see. So it'll speak twice. The first time it'll say, hello, my name is Fluffy and I'm hungry. And then it'll say, hello, my name is Fluffy, but it's no longer hungry because we fed it. So this is an interesting way of actually seeing how invoking a behavior, a method within a class or an object actually changes the data inside the object. So you can see that because I've invoked a function, I've actually changed the state for the hungry uh, property from true, which is what it is when it's initialized, to false, which is what happens after I feed it. So at the moment, it's not very useful because obviously um, you can only feed them, well, you can feed it as many times as you want, but it will never not be, um, it will never be hungry again. So, you know, there's something to, to think about here. If in a real Tamagotchi case, um, you will feed them and then they will, hang, they will be hungry um, a little bit later. So something to think about there. Now, um, let's think about the play part. Um, in the Tamagotchi world, you will get a pet that will get bored. And if you didn't play with them, they will eventually just stop responding to what you did. So let's create something similar to feed. I'm going to call it play. Of course, it's a class, so I have to call self. And then I'm going to say self board equals. And obviously, this is after playing. So after playing, I'm no longer bored. So I set board to false, but that also means I have to start by being bored. So I'm going to say board equals true in the initializer. So when a pet is first created, it will be bored. And of course here, we'll have to do something similar. Say if self board, and then code block, print, and I'm bored. So how can we test that? Again, here it will tell us whether it's bored or not. Here it will stop being hungry. So we need to make sure that we make it um, not bored. So I'm going to play with it and then tell it to speak. And hopefully in this sequence, let's run that again. Hello, my name is Fluffy and I'm hungry. And then there's an error. What does the error say? My pet speak. Ooh, I did a typo, didn't I? I should be looking at the squiggly reds because um, Visual Studio Code is really good at spotting those things. Let's try again. You can see that I'm coding this in real time because I'm making mistakes. And that's okay. That's what the uh, editor is there for, to support you. Here we go. So. My name is Fluffy and I'm hungry and I'm bored. My name is Fluffy and I'm bored. My name is Fluffy. Now, it would be nice if we could say something like, if not hungry and not bored, oops, then we could print and I'm happy save. You can see here I'm, I'm showing you something, let's repeat yourself, um, showing you something that we didn't cover in the initial slides. This is what we call um, operators, logical operators. So basically this not makes that check not hungry exactly what it sounds. So if the pet is not hungry and the pet is not bored. So and is the thing that joins these two, these two clauses together. The first clause is not hungry, the second clause is not bored. And if you look at one of the clauses on its own, hungry would be whatever the state of hungry is, true or false, and not would be the opposite of that. So if I expect hungry to be not hungry, it means I expect it to be false. I expect this hungry to be false. So if hungry is false and bored is false, then that means that I'm neither hungry nor bored. And so I want to print I'm happy. Let's try. And you can see that I've changed the, the, the code in the class. I've not touched the code in the app. That's one of the beauties of object orientation. So let's see what happens. Here we go. So after it's hungry and bored, then it's only bored, and then it's just happy because we fed them and we played with them. You can see how that is, um, is quite interesting. Now, let me show you 
something that we could do to make the pet have a photo. We mentioned here a photo. So I would like to initialize my pet with a photo. So I'm going to put a little ASCII art. In this case, it's a bit of a cat with a tail. So if I want to show that, ideally, I will have to add it here and say plus um, and oops, let's put quotes and I look like this. And then I put my photo. Save, go back to the app, run it. And this, there we go. My name is Fluffy and I look like this. You, we've made that mistake with the spaces again, which is, and I look like this. Uh, where are we? Where's the space? After the name. Yes, yeah. There you go. Again, real time coding. This is what you get. Let's run it. And there it is. My name is Fluffy and I look like this. Now, so far, we've had one pet um, and it's pretty um, standard what it does. Now, in some of the stuff that we talked about in the slides, we mentioned all the things that we can do in Python. Um, so I'm going to show you how to create a list and dictionaries, which are two of the data types that you can use in Python, and also how to then do a for loop on those. So here's one I did earlier, because it's a lot of typing. I'm just going to copy it from somewhere and paste it here. I'm going to create a pet collection. And that pet collection contains, see the square brackets? That tells me it's a list. And each item in the list is actually a dictionary, which has curly braces. And remember we said a dictionary is a collection of pairs of property or key and value. So there's a key called name, and there's a value. There's a key called age and a value. A key called weight and a key called photo, which do match the parameters we need to use to create a pet, which is quite handy. Um, so, now we have an array. Let me tell you a little bit about um, how to instantiate um, a, a list of actual objects. And to do that first, I'm going to create an empty variable that contains, or an, a variable that contains an empty list. I'm going to call it pets. And if I just put brackets, square brackets there, it knows it's going to be a list of something, but it doesn't know what yet. And now is where the fun begins. I'm going to create a for loop that iterates through my pet collection. To do that, I'm going to do for pet, and I'll explain this in a second. Pet collection, column. Now, for statements always end with column because they need a block underneath. So I'm creating a variable on the spot called pet, and that's going to take the value of each one of these items, each one of these items, every time the loop goes around. So I can actually use that value to get um, the numbers out. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to create a new variable called new pet. And then I'm going to instantiate a pipette object. And this time, instead of actually typing the values myself, I'm going to get pet, which now contains that dictionary above the first row, or the, the whatever row we're, the stage we're in, and say, I want the property name from that dictionary. And as a second parameter, see Visual Studio Code is telling me it should be age. So I'm going to do pet age. This is how you access dictionary items. You put the key and it returns the value. So pet square brackets colon uh, quotes age will return the value that belongs to that key. Then I need the weight. And then I need the photo. So Photo. Now that is created a variable called new pet, which actually is a proper pipette object. Um, and it contains, it's been initialized with the init function with these four values, which change for each row in the collection. Now I can print um, what that does. And I could do that by actually literally saying uh, new pet speak. Because if you remember, 
UPET is an actual true pipet object and therefore it has the property speak and it will tell me what I need to know about it. But also what I want to do is actually make sure that I put this new pet object inside my pets array which I created up there and it's empty, my pets list. So to do that you use pets and then the, the method append meaning I'm appending this new element, new pet, to my list of pets, which is starts off empty, but then it will iterate through four times, because there's four rows, and what it will do is create a new object, called new pet, put all the new parameters from each row, and then speak its name and its details, and then it will append that to the pets list. Now, save that, and hopefully, if I didn't make any typos, we'll see. There we go. Hello, my name is Fluffy, it's the original one. Then we have, hello, my name is Fishy. My name is Mickey. My name is Fishbones, and my name is Vampy. So, these are four pets plus the one that we created first. And you can see how the initialization is set all the parameters as we need it, and it's actually now using the speak property to make uh, the pet tell you more about themselves. And as a final thing to show you, you can do with that, that new uh, list we've created, we can actually be very lazy and feed all the pets as one at once. So we can do the same, but this time we're going to use pets, because now we have the actual object called pets. It doesn't matter that I reuse that variable name because that's internal to the for loop. So you can use it as many times as you want, as long as it's separate for loops, not embedded ones. And then I can say, okay, I want this pet to be fed. So I'm going to feed it. And then I want it to speak. And so what we should see, if I save that and run it, we're going to get a lot of text now because there's lots of actions happening here. But the last four, or the last things that we've done, see now it just says I'm bored because we fed them. We fed every single one of them. And so we now have a list of uh, four pets that are happy. Well, not happy, they're, they're fed. If I want them to be happy, I just do play as well. And then run it again. And there we go. They're all happy. Now, this is just the basics to show you how to create classes, how to instantiate objects of those classes, how to do for loops, how to use lists, how to use um, dictionaries. Um, let me show you one little thing before we close off, because I think it'd be quite good to summarize, to simplify this. this see this complicated collection of things? Let's, let's create a class level um, uh, property, which I'm going to call speak text, and that's going to be a string that says hello, my name is, and then you're going to see this really strange curly braces, and I look like this, curly braces. Now remember how I kept on making mistakes about the spaces here? Well, this is what is one of the big advantages of using this method, is that you actually write a string with what you want, but instead of putting the actual values, because you don't know them yet, we use this placeholder, the double curly brace, the, well, the, the open and close curly brace, wherever there's something you want to replace. And then instead of doing this, we just delete all these things. I'm going to use a comma, and I'm going to use our um, speak text and I'm going to use a property or a method called format and then brackets and what I want those values of these braces to be. So you can see that I've massively simplified and my laptop is about to die. Uh, let's close that. Um, you can see that we will print a formatted string, which is this one, and those values are going to be replaced. So let's save, and go back to the app, and run, and hopefully we'll see the same strings. 
or not. Speak text is not defined. Oh, see that? See the red stuff? Again, same mistake. It's part of the class. So don't forget to use self. You know, everyone does that. I do it all the time. You'd think I would have learned by now. Let's try that again. Here we go. So you see exactly the same as you saw before, but it's less likely that you're going to make that mistake with the spaces. And it keeps things much neater because you only have this once, and then you just have a very nice list of parameters you want to push into there. So that's a nice way of um, getting this uh, printing statements much clearer. So you could use that in, in a variety of places, wherever you use strings, um, we could use that. So let's recap. We've created a class which has formatable strings. It has a constructor or an initializer, which has a bunch of different parameters we want to um, contain. Um, it has uh, class um, methods like speak, feed, and play. And each one of them has a set of uh, a list of functionality within them that changes when invoked the data within the object itself. Now, in order to make use of that class, which is just the template, it doesn't really work unless you instantiate it into an object. And that's how we do that. We put a variable name. We, we call the class with the list of arguments in the init constructor um, to define the specifics, you know, the filling of the questionnaire effectively, or how that class is going to become an object. And then we can invoke the different methods, which would in turn um, enable behaviors and change data within the object. Then we looked at how to create a list with square brackets. And in this case, it's a complex list because each item is not just a single value like a string or a, or a number is actually a dictionary in the curly braces which is a collection of key value pairs name age weight and photo with their own values and some of them are strings some of them are integers some of them are floats and this is a string as well um, then we created an empty list and if you hover over it see um, visual studio code tells you the type because it's square brackets it's a list and then we showed how to use the for loop on a list. And then we actually instantiated automatically four objects, which are based on the four entries in the collection, um, using the class initializer. And then we made the pets speak and we added them to that list that we created. And now what we added then wasn't a um, dictionary anymore. It was actually true objects. So this is a list of fully functioning objects with data and behavior. Then we, to demonstrate that, we iterated again with a for loop over the list of objects themselves, and then we called different uh, behaviors within it to make sure that we could see it working. Now, let me show you, before we end, a little shortcut. Um, if I um, set, if I want to have a default value, I can actually set this to, say, 1.0. So if I don't enter a weight um, and I don't enter a photo, they will have weight one and photo, no photo, basically. Um, so if I save that and I, just to finish, create a new pet and I call pipet and I give it a name, pet one, because can't create anymore, can't think. Uh, age 23. Um, and then I'm not going to give it any more parameters. And then I'm going to say new pet speak. Save. I'm going to run that. And hopefully, if I haven't made any mistakes, there's our last one. My name is pet one, and I look like this. See, it looks like nothing because the photo defaults to blank. Um, and if I actually said New pet H no H um, wait we should see let's print it we should see the default weight because we have an entered one and there is 1.0 so the pet default weight is one because we didn't enter one like here where we entered two 
So again, that's another trick for when you have things that you know are not necessarily widely used arguments or, or constructor parameters uh, by your users, and your users being all the developers that use your classes. Um, if you know that certain things are quite rare that people are not going to use, you can give it default values, and that will mean that they can just invoke the first few parameters. This always has to be towards the end because you know it, it, Python wouldn't be able to tell which one you mean when you type them in. So what it, what you have to do is you know go backwards. So the, the least common ones will go at the end, um, and then basically if you don't fill them in, then it use those values after the equals. So there we go. We've done quite a lot of um, different things with Python. We've done classes, we've done basic variables, we've done definition, initialization, we've done functions, uh, or methods of behaviors, we've done data within the classes, we've instantiated them into objects, uh, we've used collections, we used for loops. So now you know all the basics you need to be able to meet your challenges that are coming next. I hope you enjoyed that. I know it's, it's not an in-depth look at Python, it's impossible to do that in, uh, in just an hour, but I will give you a couple of links that will be super useful if you want to know more. And there's plenty of extra tutorials out there which will allow you to do all sorts of weird and wonderful things with Python. I know that you're using it for your machine learning um, workshop as well, and you definitely use it in your next two weeks. So, you know, by the, by the end of the accelerator, you're going to be awesome developers in Python. So we'll leave it there and we'll go to our challenges. So there, I hope you enjoyed that uh, coding demo. Um, and I know that it covered quite a lot uh, very quickly. Hopefully it'll be useful for what comes next. So let's look at our challenges. Now our challenges for today and tomorrow, uh, because I want you to consolidate those two days together so you have plenty of time to code, um, are the following. First, I want you to dig into Python and those two links amongst millions of others on, on the internet uh, will point you in the direction of how to solve quick problems, uh, how to look up, you know, how to do uh, lists, how to create classes, all that sort of thing. If you think you need more support, um, the first link in particular is very, very good at finding everything that you may need very quickly. And of course, you have your mentors to, to help you through. Um, then please, 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 for your Piper project, use GitHub. I want your code to be safe. I want there to not be accidents. I want them to be able to Go back in time if you make a mistake or you want to try something different without compromising your code base. Um, plus, it will allow you to share it with your peers and uh, always know that it's safe wherever you leave it um, in your laptop. Um, then, if and only if you feel you have the time and you want the extra um, uh, demand on your um, software engineering practices, I would love you to use TDD. And to do that, basically, what you have to do is think of the requirements you want your pipe to do. What other things other than, you know, being able to be fed and playing um, can they do? And then define those with tests and then write the code to make those tests go green. That'd be awesome. But again, you know, this is about you having fun with the language. And so I prefer you to make a really fun to play game and pipe it than spending too much time with the TDD at this point. Um, and then... Of course, the biggest, biggest, biggest request I want is for your pipette to be awesome. And as I said, hungry and bored um, are states that will be there forever unless you change them. And so there's something called timers, which means that you can give something a lifetime and the variable uh, value will change at the end of that timer. Um, in that first link uh, in W3Schools, you'll see how to do timers. Um, it'd be great if after you feed a pipette um, after a defined time that you could be, it could be a parameter in your initialization, um, they become hungry again or they become bored again. So you can always play with them all the time. Add more things, add more moods and behaviors, add more um, things that you can interact with your pipette and that they can change. Same as being hungry and bored. I'm sure there's plenty of other things they could be, like a real pet. Now, if you have different moods, why not have different faces? So look at ASCII art, search A-S-C-I-I art, which is how we do those little emojis written with um, keyboard characters. Um, and then you could actually change your the look of your pet based on how they're feeling. That would be quite a cool thing to do. Now, if you want to go into the graphics, that'd be great. So if, you, if you're if you an advanced developer and know how to do graphics, that would make the game even more awesome. Um, why not get that list 
that we created of pets to start interacting with each other. So instead of being the user who, um, who does all the controlling of the pets, why not get the pets to start establishing connections? If you've ever heard of Furby, um, that's what happened when you put more than one Furby in the same room. They started talking to each other. Why not do that in your application? That would be fantastic. And anything else that you can think of that will make this something that's a long-lived application that you want to go back and back again and keep on improving it and sharing it with your friends, that would be awesome. So I want you to challenge yourself to make this an application that or a game that people will want to play. You know, let's think as a startup, let's think as someone who wants to acquire users and retain them. What would you have to do to your pipette to actually enable that? And I mentioned before when I was talking about Pipet um, of the lady who came up with the concept and uh, started a slightly different way of introducing Python, but, you know, based on this concept, it's Tatiana Taylorsky. So um, if you look in, in Twitter, you can find out more about her. Um, I've sort of adapted her, um, her uh, principles to design a Pipet. I use classes instead of using dictionaries, which is what she used. But, you know, the, the, I'm crediting her idea because it's, I think it's awesome. So... I hope this is enough to keep you really, really busy. You know you have your mentors. There's plenty of people who know Python. So don't be afraid to ask. Uh, because ultimately we want you to have fun as well as creating something fantastic. And that's it. That's the end of the workshop. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed putting it together. I hope you have something really cool to show at the end of your uh, programming days. And uh, it will be very useful for you when you start your two weeks accelerator to get you going fast and uh, be able to demonstrate your abilities. Thank you very much for listening and have fun. <laughs>